This is BBC Radio Five Live. Good morning, it's nine o'clock. I'm Nicky Campbell. It's your call. Uh, Jimmy Savile, do you support the police investigation or is it too late? Uh, police say they're chasing 120 separate lines of inquiry against him and are calling him a predatory sex offender with as many as 30 victims across the UK. Last night, his family removed the headstone from his grave. The BBC will hold its own inquiry in due course. Action is now being taken for the crimes that were committed over decades. Four decades. Some people knew what he was up to. Many heard the rumours. They dismissed them. Or they did nothing. His victims are finally coming forward. Are the police right to pursue this now, or is there no point? We want to know what you feel about this. 0500 909 693. You're with Five Live from the BBC. This is BBC Radio Five Live. Do you support the police investigation with the, on Jimmy Savile, or is it too late? Five past nine. I'm delighted to say we've got John Cameron from the NSPCC. Good morning, John. Good morning. And Michael White from The Guardian, who wrote a very interesting and thoughtful piece about all this. Hello, Michael. Hello. Hi. And <laughs> Liz Kershaw. Liz, I'm, I'm pl- really pleased you came on this morning, because you, you gave the... How, are you all right? Yeah, thanks, yeah. You gave that interview the other day on the Today programme and said how you'd been uh, groped by one uh, Radio 1 DJ at the time when you were working there. We joined the station at the same time. I remember you telling me about it. I remember it happening. I remember you going to management. And um, there's been an interesting reaction from some people to what you said, which tells its own story. Tell us more. Yeah, well, thanks, for, first of all, Nikki, for being a rock, because we both celebrated 25 years uh, joining Radio 1 last week, and it should have been a happy event. But I think it's fair to say that you and I sort of got the measure of some aspects of the place when we joined, and that's why we became friends. Um, I spoke last Saturday morning on the Today programme because I was asked to comment on whether a culture at the BBC could have supported anything that Jimmy Savile is accused of, and that's what I did. And um, I've not spoken out about it since. I've since spoken to the Director General, as I promised that I would, and I gave him some documents yesterday that I'd written out because I didn't want to go and see him just flanneling around. And I've handed those to him, and I'm now being interviewed as part of the official BBC internal inquiry. Mm. Is that into Jimmy Savile or into this other individual? Is it, or is it a general inquiry? It's a general... It's an inquiry into whether people at the BBC knew what was going on at the time. Going on, well, going on with Savile, or because he, he left, he wasn't there when we were there, but going on with, with other people or other person? Or just... No, whether the culture, as right. I experienced it, right. when I joined Radio 1, immediately after he departed, because he went out one door and, you know, I and yourself came in the next, whether um, it could have supported Savile or anybody else that he worked with, colluding with him, and also why, it, you know, people who knew about it or could have known about it, didn't do anything about it. Yeah, and this was what you complained about when that... Because um, you have to be so careful not to... Because we yeah. have, we've had this conversation <laughs> so often. But you complained when that individual groped you and you went to management. Just remind us what management said to you. They were sort of laughing and incredulous and said, what's up, Liz? Did you not like it? Are you a lesbian? Right. And, uh, you know, and what was your reaction to that reaction? I was just dismayed and disgusted and uh, thought, well, is that what you get? But, you know, there were loads of incidents um, that didn't involve physical acts, but sexual bullying, I would say. I think that was the culture. But, you know, I, I, I've, um, I've offered to give evidence and that's what I'll do. Is this from the same person? Or would you say, or from, from a sort of general culture of it, from kind of the people who'd been there for a long time? I'd, I don't, I've been accused of smearing everybody who worked there and that's not my intention. Neither am I trying to start a witch hunt. So I'd say there were some great people there and I've still got some great friends and I've had lots of messages from them this week saying, you know, you go girl, it's about time somebody talked about this. Uh, so not everybody, no, but there were one or two. Mm. Yeah, and um, what, what, what was the Director General's reaction to what you were saying? Was he uh, horrified when you kind of spelt it out? Um, I think it would be... Uh, we promised at the start of our meeting yesterday that it was in strict confidence, and um, that's not to cover up. That's just because I think it's appropriate that these matters are investigated properly, so I don't want to be... 
I respect that. Indiscreet, mm. and I don't want to be, um, you know, there's yeah. a certain etiquette involved. But I, I think, I, I think he, he wants, let's just say, he wants to talk to me again because he realises that he's mm. got a lot to learn about the culture of radio. Mm. I respect that, but, you know, I've got to ask it. Um, yeah, yeah, and, I, and I've made, and I must say, uh, this isn't, I don't think, this isn't indiscreet to say this. I was at pains to point out to him that I'm restricting my comments and my experiences to music radio where DJs are gods because I've also worked at Five Live and I've also worked at Radio 4 and I don't really have any experience of that kind of behaviour in those kind of fields of mm. radio. And when we joined, they were gods, weren't they? Those, those... They were bigger than the pop stars, or at least they thought they were, but they were also treated like that by the by the media, by the tabloids. I remember it was a, it was a culture shock kind of for all... Gosh, you know, what's... Well, you and I, I'm sure we can agree on this. I used to sit there quite often or be sort of shoved out onto the roadshow stage and I'd think, I came here because, I, you know, I love music and I'm obsessed by music and I want to meet the bands and I want to interview them and I want to share that with the listeners. This isn't what I signed up for. Mm. Um, Savile, uh, Michael, going to bring you in in a, in a minute, Jimmy Savile. As I said to you, I've said this on the radio, I said to you the other day, yeah, there were, there were sort of, you know, people saying, oh, he must be this, he must be that, he must do it. But he was such a strange sort of island of a man, such a private man in, in, in you know, what, what we thought about him. And I, I had him as a kind of, you know, great British benign eccentric. And you, yeah. couldn't, you couldn't imagine, you know, he, he was a sort of, is this the right word, unsexual individual. But there was st there were stories about everyone. You thought, well, if this, if that's true, why isn't it in the press? And this is why I'm going to bring Michael in in a second. If that's true, where are the stories? And because, you know, if, if, if there was any veracity to it, it, it would have been out by now, you know? Are you asking me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think... Um that has to be properly investigated among the people that were in a position of power at the time, uh, and that will be being done now, I'm assured. Um, ask them why, if they told these jokes at parties, and if that was the general gossip, mm. why it wasn't addressed. But I think there are two things, really. Um, first of all, as I've discovered this week, you know, it's very hard to stick your head above the parapet because... You suddenly find you're being shot down, and also you find it's a very lonely thing. I mean, I've said, I've had lots of messages from people saying, you know, about time, well done, speak out. And then you go back to them and say, okay, well, you, what, what happened to you? You know, give me, what did you witness? Give me your um, reports, your stories. And they suddenly say, they've got amnesia. And it's very hard, you know, to find people to back you up. I think there's a, still a climate of fear. And I think that's because, you know, he was a very powerful figure. The people that they worked for were powerful figures. And the only reason that I spoke out last week was because George Entwistle had I, said... The Director General. The yeah. Director General. Before I got the call on Friday night from the Today programme, you know, all, all people all people who work for the BBC must speak out if they know anything. And I sat here and thought, OK, well, if I'm asked, I will, because I don't really know where to go with this. So then I was asked by the Today programme, I thought, well, that's legitimate because, you know, it's a BBC programme, fine. Because in the back of my mind, also, Nikki, is this clause, two or three clauses in um, a BBC presenter's contract, which I think hampers people, and that is you must not discuss the BBC, its programmes, its affairs. You must not impart any information about people you've met within the BBC uh, to outside sources, you must not express a public opinion um, outside, and you can, you know, these these clauses will and can be evoked because I've been threatened in the past, a few years ago, when there was another issue I thought I should speak out publicly on. I was actually told, you do that and you'll never work here again. So, you know, it's very hard to speak out, and I've only done it because George Entwistle gave the green light. And you were asked a question by Jim Nocty, and you gave an honest answer, and you spoke about one aspect of the culture and something that had happened to you, which uh, it was horrific, and uh, the reaction of management t told its own story. And there was even what Mike Smith on the radio the other day saying, well, go on, name names, name names, prove it, prove it, prove it. Mm. And, and as, you, as you say, no wonder some of these, talking about the Savile issue, which is a separate issue, no, no wonder some of these women are afraid to come forward. Oh, exactly. 
exactly. I mean, if I've had this stonewalling from people, uh, no, we won't support what you say. You know, we, no, we can't, you know, we can't say what we saw. We can't, you know, be witnesses. No, we know nothing. What about these poor girls who are 14 years old? You know, you know what I'm like. Uh, I'm a 54-year-old woman and you've, you've known me for 25 years and I'm a feisty person and I would kick off. Um, <laughs> and if I've been intimidated or felt, you know, frightened to speak out, imagine what it's like if you're a anonymous little girl. Michael White, you come in here. Hello. Hi. Inter fascinating listening to Liz's position. Yes, it's, um, it's a grim story, and uh, well done her for talking out. It's never easy to put your head above the parapet, as she says. <clears throat> Two things strike me listening to it. One is that um, BBC senior management um, failed in a duty of care. Savile was too important to them. He was too famous. He was a celeb uh, and a, a valuable uh, uh, property. Uh, and they failed the young people who were uh, vulnerable to him. And it obviously more extensive than that. But having said that, you've got to remember the culture was different. I was talking to a woman friend my end, my age who said um, the other day, well, you know, when I first went to work at 18, you were groped in the office, all sorts of things happened. And when you complained, just as Liz said, they said, what, you didn't like it? You were a lesbian? I mean, it makes you flinch to think of it now. It was common. It didn't stop for my friend, oddly enough, till she went to work in the public sector, not the private sector. A lot of women have that story. So don't, you know, we mustn't apply our own standards and pretend it should always been like that. A lot of things went on. Um, my other interest was when the tabloids piled in on the BBC uh, this last week. They love to kick the BBC, don't they? BBC is open to criticism here. Nonetheless, I thought, well, boys, why didn't you do it? You're obsessed with sex and celebrity. Why didn't you get Jimmy Savile? They did get a couple of people, of course. Um, but, um, and I, I spoke to my tabloid friends about this, and they said, well, it's difficult. Don't forget, there wasn't the Internet. People have to come forward. They have to be prepared to testify uh, very often. Young women are sort of vulnerable people. These kind of people pick on the vulnerable. They, they, they just watch the people they think they can get away with it with. They won't stand up to them or talk to their parents. Maybe they're estranged from their parents. They're really crafty. Well, I'll tell you, with Liz, with Liz Kershaw, that particular individual picked on the wrong, no, wrong woman. No, no, I'm not. No, I didn't. I wasn't talk, Of course I wasn't talking mm. about her. Nonetheless, yeah. as a generalization, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. And they said, my friends, tough guys in Fleet Street said, uh, it's much too difficult. And of course, if we had got it wrong and been successfully sued for libel. Jimmy Savile started to sue the Sun in 2008, I noticed the other day. Then the BBC and the Guardian and the Liberal Press would have been saying, bloody tabloids like they do. And there's some truth in that too, I'm afraid. So um, we should have done something. And the police certainly should have done something, but we saw in the case in, um, of grooming uh, young women in the north of England recently that the police, pretty indifferent to young women, uh, in care, some of them coming and making complaints. Uh, and, uh, and so the police culture is part of it too. We've, I'm afraid we've let a lot of people down, mm. all of us. Mm. Let's, let's bring a caller in. Uh, let's go to Ray in Edinburgh. Ray, what, is it worth it, this investigation? Uh, no, first I'd like to say that I didn't like Jimmy Savile even when he was alive. So I'm not, I'm not a Jimmy Savile fan, but I just think it's a waste of media time, police time, uh, to go over this when he can't defend himself. You said the word crime earlier on. I don't know how you can say that. If, if he hasn't been charged, obviously he can't be charged because he's dead. And I can't understand how the news of the world at the time and the sun, they must have known about all this was going on and they never did anything about it. I just think it's way too long 40 years after it happened, or 20 years, or 10 years, or however long, and the media has just gone on about it now, and it's just an end story, because there's nothing to defend. Well, uh, Liz, why do you think this investigation is important? Well, I was listening to your programme earlier, and there was a, a reporter on from Leeds talking about Jimmy Savile's funeral, attended by 4,000 people, uh, adoring fans, possibly, and there was a lady quoted from the crowd who now says she feels conned. And while I think... Um, it's important is because I don't think we should hold public figures up for adulation. I don't think we should persist in revering them and conning the public if they're not deserving of that. So I think it's better well, why the do public you have to wait till they're dead to do it. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Why do you have to wait till they're dead to do that? 
I didn't wait. Um, you know, I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about you. I'm you talking think, about the you think, well, it, it takes a lot. If, if people t talk about the stuff that happened to them, as you would have seen from the documentary and see the other women and Victoria interviewed uh, somebody the other day to come forward, it's, you're unleashing a lot of stuff that you've wanted to cover up in your own life and it takes a, a great deal of, of, of bravery to... to no, come. I'm not talking about the victims here. I'm talking about the media here. I don't know why the tabloids didn't do something because... They did anything they could about Radio 1 DJs when we were there. You only had to, you know, put a fork in your mouth and your picture was in the paper saying, you know, what's she eating? Isn't she overweight? So why didn't they tackle more, more uh, important issues? I don't know the answer to that. All right, we're going to address that. Uh, let's uh, break, the, break for the travel, then we'll speak to uh, some more callers. And also um, John Cameron from the NSPCC. Michelle? Let's, uh, let's hear from Ken and Luton. Ken, go on. Good morning. morning, Ken. Ken. Hello, Ken. Uh, I grew up in the... I was a teenager in the 60s and all that, and we see all this uh, girls chasing pop stars and DJs and all that, but there's one per one thing that no one's answered yet. Where were these girls' parents? They're well, some of, them, some, of them, some of them were at... Girl, you know, uh, were at um, a home... Um, so that, that's that question answered. My um, father, if my sister would come um, home after nine o'clock, she would not come home after nine o'clock again. Mm. And uh, wh where were their parents when the, these girls were chasing these pop stars and DJs? Thank you very and much for asking that. Go back? Thank you for why did they go back? Um, John Cameron. Hello. Explain. Well, um, as you've heard from Michael and Liz, that the culture of the times 40 years ago is completely different to what it is now and what we've got to remember is that when children are abused the people responsible for that abuse are the perpetrators um, and it's very easy to think to yourself well you know children ought to be locked up indoors etc but you know children are going to go out they want to visit people they want to see them they need to do that safely and 40, 50 years ago, the procedures that they had in place to safeguard children in these kind of visits um, to studios, etc., were completely different from what they are now. And what we, it's essential to remember is that children are still at risk in our communities now, and we need to be encouraging people to speak out, however difficult that may be. Mm. Yeah, Liz, people need to be encouraged to speak out, don't they? Oh, absolutely, and um, I'll, you know, for all the sort of slack and, and being imprisoned in my own house for the last few days, virtually, um, with the tabloids camping out on my doorstep, uh, I can only say that it's worth it because I think I've contributed by speaking out on Saturday morning. Um, I, you know, I, not just me, I'm not taking full credit, but people like me speaking out, you know, a lot more people have come forward, and yeah. it's perhaps given people courage to think, well, if she can do it, or she can do it, then yes, I'm going to grasp the nettle and I'm going to do it. Are you going to name this guy, or did you name him to the director general? I was told um, on Saturday. I, 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 I was naive. I would have gone on the radio and named him, but <laughs> I was told by the BBC I mustn't name him. And um, no, I didn't name him yesterday for reasons that are illegal. I think even in, within a private meeting. So but the Director-General doesn't... I did say, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm not afraid to name him. It's just that um, I think that it's not about me having somebody rubbing gin around in my bra. It's about the management response. Let's yeah. come back to that. Yeah. And it's not about one individual who's now, you know, quite old and it wasn't um, unique and I, I'm not here for a witch hunt, and I'm not here to smear people. I think the people who are, should be accountable and should be investigated are the people who allowed this to happen. So I've said that I will name this individual if there's any concrete evidence against him that he's committed a criminal offence. Um, I don't consider that 25 years ago worth pursuing criminally, but if anything else comes to light, I will be happy to give evidence and back people up. So you didn't even tell the, the, the DG who it was? Um, I was advised that at this stage it's best to keep the name to myself. Right, OK. Although in some newspapers have gone pretty close to the line, haven't they? I have.
haven't told a soul the name, but I've had the name shouted at me in the street, so people are, sh- are drawing their own conclusions. Mm. Elizabeth calls us. Hello, Elizabeth, from uh, Inverness. Hello. Good, uh, good morning. Um, at the point I want to make, I know a lot of people are phoning in saying, what's the point pursuing this when Jimmy Savile is dead now? Well, the point is there are other uh, predators out there who may be grooming children as we speak, and they may have second thoughts. They may think, this is not acceptable, I'm going to be caught. And there are obviously, every time there's paedophiles, there are people who collude and help them gain access to children. You know, they're very clever people and they're very manipulative people. And women come forward much later. I worked, um, when I was training as a social worker, I worked with Children First, which, I mean, you'll know, is the agency in Scotland that deals with children. And very many women came forward. If they were abused when they were seven, when their own daughter was seven, all these terrible memories came back that they tried to bury. And they were always told, you're to blame because of the way you dressed, because you were, you know, it was your fault. It was always the girl or the boy's fault, because boys get molested as well. So I think if it even stops one paedophile who is grooming people as we speak, if it even stops one, it's well, well worth pursuing. Well said. Uh, that is a very good... Liz, I was very encouraged by your your stand there. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think, I think both of you... Well I, said. I, th- I think both of you are actually inspiring other people to, to, to speak out, Elizabeth. It is, but all of you, are, you're, you're both really right here that uh, since this inquiry has kicked off, we've had a lot of people calling the NSPCC now who's saying, look, I need for the first time for many years to speak out about my abuse because I think that person is still around and play, presenting a risk to children. And I also have concerns for other children as well. So these kind of inquiries, when people say that they're a waste of police time, they're not because what they're doing is they're clearly identifying other children at risk in our in, in our neighborhoods is there a danger Liz that some people are saying that because you're saying it was this 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 big radio on figure people are speculating like mad and it's uh, it is smearing otherwise in, some otherwise innocent people well it's really regrettable but I think should, people should get over me and my breasts and just focus on what the real issue is, here is that a public figure, a knight of the realm, evidently was abusing underage children and uh, people within the BBC quite possibly knew about it and very definitely laughed about it and joked about it. And I, I told the Director General one of the jokes yesterday and he looked a bit ashen-faced. So can that's you, my goal. Can you so, tell us? <laughs> uh, I don't think... I don't think I, I'm not a comedian. I don't think it'd come over hilariously. No, but, but just to give involved, us an, an idea of the culture. A, it's involved a rocking caravan, a young girl, an old lady in a jar of jam, and I'm sure you've heard it. I don't think I have, but was it, was it a Savile joke? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was told in company, you know, ha, 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 trebles all round. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's, um, that's why I thought, hmm, it's a bit odd, you know, when I was at Radio 1, that that kind of thing was sort of, seem to be well known. Can I just tell you something? We were talking about why don't people come forward? Mm. And I've said I've had a lot of um, support. And I got a text yesterday from somebody who's not given me permission to name her or the individual involved. But she's a household name and she's a big TV star. And she said that she'd been on the TV, national TV, for about three years. And she went to the BBC in the mid-80s. I won't... I won't say she went to see, but a very powerful individual, to see if there was any work around at the BBC for her, and she says, uh, he looked me up and down and said, sorry love, not for us, your tits aren't big enough. So how spo- somebody's supposed to go to a, p- a figure of management like that and tell them what they think's going on in the Jim will fix it dressing room? When was that? mid-80s. Right, because the BBC, you know, at the moment, it's one of the, like, the most PC organisation going. Oh, yeah, nowadays, yeah. you can't interview, uh, you know, you, you can't interview somebody under 18 on air unless you've got the parental permission, yeah. and you can't have people coming into the building under 18 to take part in shows unless, you know, it's all been vetted and approved. Um, it's very stringent now. Well, there are people who work with Savile, aren't there, in TV and radio, who perhaps have questions to answer? That's why I've given the Director General a list of names. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, 
lots of support for you on 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 text and and Twitter, and I know that does does mean something because it's been a strange old week for you, Liz. Well, when you're sitting in your house on your own, and you know you hear a rustle in the hedgerow, you are alarmed. To paraphrase the Led Zeppelin song, and you go out, and it's a bloke with a long lens camera, and he's been there all day, <laughs> taking pictures of you sitting at your computer through the French windows. It's very un- in, un- I've had to sit here with my gates bolted this week. But can I just say one final thing? Uh, the BBC brand is so important, not just to the people of this country for whom it provides, you know, ad-free television and radio and outstanding stuff at times, but also around the world. When I've been around the world, I realise how revered it is and what a great ambassador it is for this country. At a time when, you know, we're a small... Uh, country and we're, our, our industries are in decline but you go anywhere in the world bbc it's a badge of honor and it's it's really respected and i think this is terrible for the bbc because it's just damaging the bbc's reputation i think it needs to be addressed investigated nipped in the bud we need to find out why this went on who who let it go on and we need to also know why that Newsnight programme was scrapped and by whom. Right. I'm seeing you tomorrow for a coffee. I'll see you then. See you then. Thanks. See ya. As Liz. It's 9.32. Let me remind you about your call. Thanks again to Liz Kershaw for coming on the programme. Uh, incredibly uh, powerful, uh, forthright testimony from Liz. Um, we ask in question this morning, Jimmy Savile, do you support the police investigation or is it all too late? Th- this... There's another aspect of this terrible story, this old Jimmy, awful Jimmy Savile saga. Sylvia Nicholl is a trustee of Stoke Mandeville Hospital Trust. She knew Jimmy, Jimmy Savile since the early 70s. She spoke to me earlier on breakfast. I prefer to wait until hopefully we do have a police inquiry and a BBC inquiry. But the trouble is, I think in life you can only only judge by what, you yourself have seen and known and in these years that I've known Jimmy Savile at Stoke Mandeville Hospital I have never ever seen anything but good excellent behaviour and certainly no inappropriate behaviour I mean so how can I change my opinion of Jimmy I can only know what I've seen Anne in West Sussex, Brian in Abingdon, Stuart in Oldham. Anne, what do you think? Oh, well, I understand why the speaker just now said what she did. But usually um, the perpetrators in situations like this are the respectful people. They do good work in the community. They are applauded by everyone around them. And I do applaud Liz, who spoke out earlier, because obviously she is a respected, intelligent woman, and she will be heard Many of the victims are not people whose voices would have been heard. Those victims in the children's home that we hear, that we used, um, you know, how was anyone going to believe them? And one of them did complain at the time about Jimmy Savile's behaviour to a superior, and in the, in the ITV documentary, uh, the girl said that uh, the superiors, uh, you know, said, how dare you say that about Uncle, Uncle Jimmy? Brian in Abingdon. Hello, Brian. Hi. I, I think the police are right in... Uh carrying on the investigation it now appears that there are well over a hundred people who are making uh, accusations about his behavior if this man's reputation has been ill-gained and he's revered as almost sainthood by certain people it's only right that the true jimmy shovel is exposed i mean it's not it's not right that this man um would appear would appear to have carried on the way he did, and when uh, to a number of police forces were warned about him, um, his excuse was, "Well, you know, I, I'm popular, and these people are coming forward for only for their own sort of um, glory seeking." And if you publish stories like this, my efforts of raising money for charity will all dry up and all the money for these charities they won't get the money that appears to me to be almost blackmail to the police mm. oh, may i just say something nikki yeah this 
these events, and they've happened in many places, and Rochdale was another example, they can only happen because people who could do something collude and are involved. And I think there will be a lot of scared people today in this country who've known what's gone on or maybe even participated who are not sure what's going to happen next. But if it stops, something like this, if young people are listened to when they say something has happened, and obviously it's investigated properly, clearly, yes, yes. then this yes. case will be worth it. OK, let's hear from Stuart and then Christopher as well in Birmingham. Stuart, what would you like to say? I don't believe Jimmy Savile abused anyone. I think you're crucifying the man. Let's have a look at the, the good he did. He, he raised millions for charity. What are you going to do with all that? How are you going to bring it all up in, and burn it in a big bonfire? Uh, will you be keeping that? He abused nobody. I met Jimmy in the 60s in the, uh, when he used to compare a lot of pop shows in the early 60s. In the, he, there, there was no abuse at all. The, and you've got to think of the 60s and now are different things. The 60s, there was a lot of promiscuity about Nicky. It was, there was promiscuity, sex was available everywhere. Jimmy Savile was not an abuser. Now you, you, you're crucifying this fine man. It has to stop and stop now. A lot of these girls who, who were six, uh, teenagers in the 60s, they went back to Jimmy over and over again. They weren't just abused. You know, that weren't abuse. Why did they keep going back? Why are they coming out now? It's really upset me, this. That's, he's a fine man. He's raised millions for charity. And you're, you're pinning him up and, and crucify him. There were other stories in the papers in the 60s about some of the royals. Why don't you investigate them? John Cameron. Hi. From the NSPCC. How do you react to that? If a 14-year-old child... And it's a child, fourteen. Yeah, but you're talking is having a sexual. Now, not the six. Yeah, How old but, are you? okay. Let, no, let's... If a fourteen-year-old is having sex with an adult man, that is abuse. It's whether it's in the sixties, the forties, or indeed now, that is sexual abuse. You're taking clear advantage of a child. A child at fourteen does not understand the implications of having sexual relationships well, Jimmy Jamble, and the risk not, they're not guilty of that. Well, what we're saying is that there are people now who are is, saying that they have had sexual relationships with this man. That information needs to be assessed appropriately. And it's very important that we are clear that if people have information about the abuse of children, they will be their their information will be taken seriously. You tell if me we how give are you a, going to prove that now? How are you going to prove that after fifty years? Well, it, it's not necessarily about proving or disproving. So you're what, crucifying the man. Well, what we're doing is we're rightly listening to people who have say who are saying that they've had an abusive experience from Jimmy Savile. And it's right and proper that we listen to those people if and we give them ones, support. Why did they go back five and six times? Because that's what happens with children. Children Rubbish. get caught. Rubbish. Well, children get well, caught. Well, let's, let's hear from somebody who was abused, actually. I think my, my apologies for interrupting me. Christopher, you can perhaps understand some of this, can't you? I, I can indeed. And I'd just like to say at that last corner, I don't know what his name is, the guy with the Yorkshire type accent. Yeah. Right, I'll just say that, that he, he, he epitomises all that has been wrong in the past about, um, about uh, child sex abuse and paedophilia. He epitomises it over why vilify him now and why did they wait to come forward. He, you know, he obviously has never been in that position, so he doesn't understand. But thankfully, the winds of change are blowing. You, right have, you have been in that position. Alley. You have been in that position. You do understand. Try and give us a sense of... I do, and, and what, what prompted me to call you was, was Liz Kershaw, because I, I support every single word that came out of that lady's mouth. You know, she, she has got this. We're talking here about Jimmy oh, let, Savile. Let's, 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 let's listen to... Well, you, you, you're putting these thoughts on Jimmy Savile. It's nothing to do with Jimmy Savile. Let's Nicky. listen to Christopher, because Christopher was abused by a priest. And was, well, was he a may have been was abused, a by a, a, abused by a priest, but he wasn't abused by Jimmy Savile. Now stop classing this as Jimmy Savile. Thank you very much for your call. Christopher, tell us your story. Yeah, um... That's exactly what I mean. Um, the uh, 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 what, I, what I was trying to say was that um, was that yes, I was abused by my Catholic priest, who was also my scout master, and so on and so forth. And and uh, and I, I I I could not speak about it. it. It happened to me when I was ten, eleven years of age, and I could not speak about it to anybody until I was into my mid twenties. And when I did, the reaction I got 
horrified me and so I just clammed up on it and never spoke about it again for another 20 years when I went to the police Can I ask you what the reaction was when you spoke about it? Uh, the reaction was was, 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 was that, uh, that, that it was my fault and I'd done something to encourage this because they knew this priest they knew him to be a great, great man you know, similar to Jimmy Savile really uh, they knew him to be a really good man, and was it was it was this my imagination? Was it something which I'd actually uh, caused to happen myself? And it was not, and it, and, and it did later emerge that um, that this particular priest was a predatory paedophile, and um, and many others came forward and told the same story as myself afterwards, just the same as what is happening with Jimmy Savile, and. Uh, I went to the police about this, and, and the police investigated him, and they were ready to, uh, to, to put him in court to stand trial. And then his medics came forward, because he was from a very wealthy family, and his medics came forward, and they put forward a case that he was, he was in the uh, stages of senile dementia and was not fit to stand trial, and he never did, and he died some three or more years later uh, after the police inquiry. And... Um, and now I'm vilified all over the internet because, you know, this guy's no family is known all over the world. And, uh, and I'm vilified all over the internet. And the most, the most regular thing that comes out on, on blogs and forums and so on is, why did you wait till he was dead before he bought this out? But that, that is where the facts have actually been twisted because I bought it out 10 years before he was dead. He was investigated by the police. But what is written today and what is spoken today is what people like the previous caller will take on board. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they might as well go into a stable and get a pair of horses' blinkers and put them on. What about all that bit about, oh, but he did such good, he was such a good man, did such a lot for charity? Uh... Did my particular man, he did... He did Oh, he did an immense amounts for charity, and in particular, children's charities, which, which I found to be a little bit of an anomaly, really. Well, we're so good gaining access. And... But, uh, but uh, if I could just say something else, I became a disruptive child afterwards. And as a consequence of that, I was put into, um, into a children's home. Uh, up in Nantwich, Cheshire, and it was run by uh, an order of, of similar Catholics called the John Baptist de la Salle Brothers. And um, really speaking, I was, taken, I was taken out of the pan and put into the fire because the place was just run by sort of uh, uh, people who'd, who'd, who'd aimed to become tutors in these places because children were their interest and sexual interests. And um, I remember one guy from, uh, I think he was from Sheffield or Leeds or somewhere around that area, who I knew quite well. And, and he, he used, to, I can remember him telling me about Jimmy Savile when I didn't even know who Jimmy Savile was. And I don't think many people knew who he was. And what the story which he told was that Jimmy Savile used to go around with his henchmen and he used to run dance clubs and whatnot in that area. And he used to strut about with a walking cane and whatnot. And his idea was to keep discipline within these dance halls. And um, if he couldn't find anybody who was out of order, he'd just pick on any individual and get his guys just to beat him up as an example of that's what you get if you mess about on my premises. And I, and I really disliked that man ever since. Mm. And every time I've seen him on the television, I thought if people... I wonder if that story was true, what I was told all those years but ago. It, but it wasn't in the papers, it was, you know, so... No, you know, no, no, yeah. it wasn't in the papers. He wasn't known then, he was yeah. just... From he was years ago. I running dance clubs up north. Yeah. Christopher, I applaud you for coming on. Thank you for cut your call this morning. Thank you. It's 9.49. We're going to speak to the former editor of the Sunday Mirror in uh, 40 seconds. Michelle. Uh, Paul Canew, former uh, editor of Sunday Mirror. i have been around the, the, the block on Fleet Street over the years. And we, when we discussed this last week, when all this at first broke, you were on the programme. And um, Paul, it's good of you to come on again. And Pleasure. I just, what, you had a story, or you had stories about Savile uh, back in, uh, what, the 80s or? It, no, the nine, it's about 18 years ago, it's about 1994. 94. What was, the sto what was the story? The story, I won't go into the circuitous route, but we, had, but, but we actually had, had two women by this stage in their thirties, one with uh, with children, um, who told us about their experience with Jimmy Savile. Both were from the Dunstan uh, approved school background, um, um, but they were but, but through a mixture of fear and embarrassment and frailty, they they wanted to be, to be the catalyst for exposing Jimmy Savile, who'd been in the news over 
uh, one of his big charity uh, spectaculars, and um, but they were too afraid to go into the witness box and, uh, and sign affidavits and go into the witness box. Were you paying so them? Were you paying them? No, we were not paying them at all. They didn't ask for any. They didn't ask for any money. And, they did, and we only one of them came to us. The other, the other one, we tracked down because she had a vague idea of where she then then lived. In fact, but but she didn't wasn't in direct contact with us. So there was no collusion between them. They were t- totally separate uh, people. Uh, you know, not, not as a package. Um, but. But because of the of the draconian libel laws, in fact, that uh, the fact they they couldn't go into the witness box, or were afraid to go into the witness box. We we couldn't publish the story. I well, hang on, you say draconian libel laws? That's a huge debate. But anyway, go on. Well, yes, but at the moment we're reviewing the libel laws in this country, and I think they need to be, you know, the, the Savile case, the classic example. And I hope Lord Leveson's also right. good you know, point. Yeah, good point. Looking, looking at this because you know. Any moves that make it even harder for newspapers to actually investigate or publish stories are not going to are going to be counterproductive. What aspects of the libel laws scuppered it? What did your lawyers say to you? Well, the lawyers said to us quite quite rightly that, in fact, uh, to, to my frustration, but you know, but I in the end I couldn't really argue it. The case was that you know, if you had if you couldn't produce the victims in the witness box, you were on a, you were you, you couldn't even get to first base. You were on a hide a complete hiding. And with Savile's profile and the fact that he was, without doubt, would have cited all his wonderful charity work being damaged, you were going to be looking at, you know, at a massive libel payout and the reputational damage that the paper that went with it. So, I mean, it was a no-win situation. Mm. And did you approach Savile? We didn't approach Savile directly. We did track down a former member of staff at the Dunstan approved school who they said that you know was aware of what was going on and they'd complained to that person was exceedingly negative <laughs> she said the door was something in the face more than once um so, so, so who, and who, who was that that was a former member of staff at dunstan who they said right. who they said was aware of what was going on and they'd actually complained to one of them one of them said they should complain to um but but funnily enough several who i knew slightly professionally through us through a mutual contact, about two, a couple of months later, could have even been longer, I had a message saying that, uh, that Jimmy appreciated the fact that we hadn't touched this dreadful story, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and that how this totally defamatory story would have, would have actually damaged all this great charity work if we had published it. In fact, now, there's only one way that Jimmy Savile could have known about that, because the women had no contact with him, was that the former member of the Dunstan staff uh, had alerted him um, to the fact we were investigating. Mm. I wonder if you... Th- go on. Sorry, but I, but I do think that this does... The theme of your programme, this has to be thoroughly investigated because, because there, there will doubtless be people still alive who are either fellow perpetrators or involved in a cover-up, and I think that... I think there can't be closure, that dreadful word, but you know, closure for the victims and also that the public need to know what went on. And let's not forget that police forces, we now know that at least half a dozen police forces, you know, were alerted during Jimmy Settle's lifetime and for whatever reasons were unable to bring cases. And I think that, is, that also has to be part of the investigation. The BBC are getting a lot of flack, partly deserved, but I think... Because why does well, he's described in his son as he's described in the son of Beeb as Beeb pervert. Uh, w- w- I mean, it would be as some would argue might be as appropriate as call him, you know, NHS pervert because of all the well, stuff he he did at Stoke Mandeville, for example. Yes, exactly. I think I think the BBC are part of the uh, of the thorough investigation, and obviously there are there are questions to be asked, serious questions to be asked about the BBC. But I think also there are serious questions to be asked about. Uh, uh, about the authority, about the police, and and the and even some charities and, and the authorities. and the press and for not and the, for, and, for not and, and, and the press too. But in fact, but I think in the press's case, in fact, you know, um, certainly in my case, anyway. So would you say to Lord Leveson, we had Michael White earlier on saying, why didn't the press do something about this? Michael White from the Guardian, the paper that, of course, has been at the forefront of. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the phone hacking scandal in, in 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 revealing it. Now this is different from the phone hacking scandal. We're in danger of conflating a number of issues here. But in the, in the general climate of the times, making it more difficult for the press to expose stories, which is what some people fear may come out of Leveson. Do you fear that if there were a Jimmy Savile operating at the moment, it would be, uh, you know, uh, even more difficult? 
could be even more difficult. It depends. I certainly, my, by pure coincidence, my local MP, and Maine, the MP for, for, for St Albans, has written to Lord Leveson and asking him to actually... Uh, I'm, going, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to go to um, Laura. Uh, stay there, listen to this. Laura's in Evesham. Hello, Laura. Hello. In a statement, Buckinghamshire Healthcare said it was unaware of any record of reports of inappropriate behaviour during his work with the Trust, um, and are going to work 100% with the police investigation. Tell us your story as quickly as you can. I'm so sorry to rush I you. was a patient at Stoke Mandeville for, in the spinal unit for six months in the 80s. How, and how old were you? I was 28. Right. And I distinctly remember one day when the nurses were getting, you know, washing, turning, and all the things when you're stuck in bed, there was chatter and miserable faces about the fact that Jimmy Savile was due to do um, what they called the, his particular ward round that day. And they were talking to themselves about which one would be the, as they put it, chosen one to go off with him to his little room. And to his little room? Well, that's what I didn't realise he had his own room at Stoke. And I'm, I mean, I've since obviously read the stuff in the papers recently, and apparently he, I think somebody... Small well, flat, apparently, yes. Pardon? It was, a small, it was a small flat, apparently, he was given news for. I, I think, I mean, I don't know, I can just, they didn't, and the nurses didn't call it, but I can just remember one of them saying, I wonder which one of us would be the chosen one to go off to his little room. I, I assumed, because of the things you'd heard, that he was going to come and sort of sweep the ward, but that wasn't the thing at all, and, and I just remember the nurse was t tucking me in, saying, um, the best thing you can do is pretend to stay, stay in bed, don't have to be put in your wheelchair today, and pretend to be asleep, which was quite odd, because they, they used to encourage you to get up as soon as you were able to get up, to get up in your wheelchair as soon as possible. And so well, I duly did as I was told and lay there and pretended to be asleep whilst he wandered around and sort of loitered at the end of the bays and talked to anybody who was in it. Well, you know... You told the story in, uh, uh, very powerfully. A hospital spokesman declared the hospital will work 100% with the police investigation, which will seek to find what, if anything, was known or reported about his conduct during his time there. Laura, I cannot thank you enough. Sorry for hurrying you. It's the nature of things when we're approaching the news. Um, thank you.